Sometimes, no matter how much you want it or how hard you try, it's just not possible for you to save a deposit at this point in time. So today I want to talk about 10 things you can do if you can't save a house deposit at the moment. Believe it or not, but there are things that you can do, steps that you can take in order to move towards your goal of buying a property and achieving financial freedom, even if you can't actually afford to save a deposit right now. So I've got 10 different things that I want to go through with you today. The first thing is to invest in something else. Property has a high price tag. You need a lot of money to enter the property market. However, not all investments are like that. For example, the share market you can get in with a lot less money. To get into the property market, even if you're buying a cheaper property, you're going to need tens of thousands of dollars. However, to get into the property market, you could potentially do it with as little as a thousand dollars or maybe even less. So maybe you don't have a deposit and you don't earn enough to save a large amount of money to buy a de- to have a deposit to buy a house, but maybe you could actually invest in something else and begin growing your wealth in another area. Then over time, eventually as your wealth increases, you might be able to move some of that money over to actually invest in property and buy the property like you've been dreaming of. The second thing you can do when you can't save a deposit, start learning about property. I think it was Robert Kiyosaki that said, the less you know, the more money you need and the less money you make. But the more you know, the less money you need and the more you can make. Financial knowledge will increase the amount of money that you can make, will increase your return on investment. And the smarter you get, you'll be able to invest with less money, invest smarter and hopefully grow your portfolio quicker. So just because you can't save your deposit and you can't invest in property now, doesn't mean you shouldn't be learning about how to invest in property. Look at me, given my circumstances and the fact that I've changed jobs a few times and now moved into self-employment, I can't actually buy my own property. However, I learn about property every single day, so when the time does come, which will hopefully be very soon, I am able to pounce, get into the market and know what I'm doing. So learn about property, spend some time, on your commute, listening to a podcast like this one, or reading a blog, or pick up a property magazine, or pick up a property book. I recommend C. McKnight's Zero to 130 Properties in 3.5 Years. You can get that by going to onproperty.com.au forward slash 130, so 130, and that will redirect you to Fishpond, which is an online book retailer, and you can get it there. But that's a great book that you could listen to or you could read and learn more about investing in property. So when the time does come, you're able to invest, or you might find a way around the fact that you can't save a deposit, so you can go out there and invest. Third thing that you can do is look at ways that you can start making more money. So this might be through getting a raise in your employment, it might be through changing jobs, it might be through a side business, it might be through a second job, or it might be through any other means. There are so many other means that you can do that. In a future episode, I'm going to look at 60 radical ideas of ways that you can save a deposit within 12 months. Some of those ways we're going to be looking at different ways that you can make more money so that you can save your deposit faster. Fourth thing that you can do is you can look for an investment partner. So maybe you can't afford to save a deposit and invest yourself. But potentially, if you invested with someone else, they could put up some of the deposit so you wouldn't need to save as much, or you could organize a situation where you put in the elbow grease, you put in all of the legwork, and they provide the deposit, and then you organize a share of the property, and you get a share of the profits. Even though you might not put a deposit in, you might put in some financial stake by obviously going on the mortgage, and then also you can put in your effort and your expertise into getting that property, and hopefully that property goes up in value, you can make a profit, and then you can shift to your own investments after that, or you can continue investing with your partner. The fifth thing that you can look at is look at purchasing items that retain their value. So we live in a consumer culture and we can try and find it as much as possible and it's very important to budget and to spend less than you earn. But sometimes a little tweak in what you spend your money on can actually have a dramatic effect 
later down the road. And by buying items that don't lose their value, it's going to give you a portfolio of consumer items over time that you may be able to sell and offload in order to put towards a property. For example, two years ago, or it would have been four years ago now, me and my wife purchased a Bugaboo Pram secondhand. Bugaboo is a very expensive brand, very expensive brand of stroller, baby stroller, and we purchased it for $600. We used that for six to nine months and then we sold it and we actually sold it for $625. Because we had purchased it secondhand in the first place, it didn't lose its value over the time. The same has happened six months ago, I bought a fridge for $200 because my big fridge didn't fit. We've now moved house again, my big fridge frit fits, and so I'm going to sell that old fridge and I'll probably get more than $200 for it. So there's a couple of examples of items that I spent money on, but they retained their value because I didn't buy them at retail price, I bought them at a wholesale price or I bought them secondhand. So what can you buy and what can you have fun purchasing and using your consumer money to purchase those items but that they actually retain their value. So in the near future, you can sell those items, get that money back and use it for investing. So it's just a way to tweak your consumer habits so you're actually building wealth um, and having fun spending at the same time. Sixth thing that you can do if you can't save a deposit is simply start by saving 1% of your income. So rather than trying to save a significant amount and save your deposit within 12 months, why not just start and save something? Maybe it's 1% of your income. So if you're earning $5,000 a month, well that would be $50 a month, not a significant amount of money. Or you could save as little as a dollar a day, 50 cents a day. It doesn't really matter the figure. It just matters that you start getting in the habit of saving. Obviously over time, you may find that 1%, you can actually stretch to 2% and then you can stretch to 3% of your income and 4% and work your way up. So rather than trying to save this huge deposit and save a huge amount of money, which is unrealistic for you, why not just start the habit of saving with a very small portion of money? learn to put it away as soon as you get paid, learn not to touch it, and then over time that will begin to build up and you may find increased motivation to save more and to grow that habit. So saving 1% or a really small amount in the beginning can be a really effective tool towards saving your deposit. Number seven is to increase your financial knowledge. So just like we talked about learning about property and learning about the property market, it can also be wise to increase your financial knowledge. So learn more about money, learn about how money works. I recommend Robert Kiyosaki's book for this instance. The best one that I recommend is called The Cash Flow Quadrant. And if you want to check that out, go to onproperty.com.au forward slash cash flow quadrant. Q-U-A-D-R-A-N-T is how you spell quadrant and that will redirect you to Fish Pond again. But this book is awesome because it talks about the different ways people make money. People make money as an employer, as an employee working dollars for hours. People make money as self-employed, so they own small businesses and do most of the work themselves, which is currently the situation I'm in. People own, uh, earn money through businesses, so their business run whether they're there or not, and they earn income from that. And then people earn income from investments, which is like, in investing in property, but learning about the different ways people make money, beginning to increase your financial intelligence can allow you to see opportunities that you wouldn't have seen otherwise. I remember reading Rich Dad Poor Dad, which is another one of Robert Kiyosaki's books years and years ago, and it just flicked the switch in my mind. I then went through all of his series. He's got more than 10 books and I read all of them. And even though it didn't make me a millionaire overnight, it made me think about money differently. And now I have, even though I'm self-employed and working a lot, the business that I've created is actually largely passive. So a lot of the work that I'm doing now, like creating this video, is actually growing my business. However, what I've done in the past is still working for me and generating a passive income, both through on property and through other websites that I have as well. So by increasing my financial intelligence, I was able to create passive income for myself without actually investing in property or investing in shares or needing to earn a lot of money. And so by increasing your financial intelligence, there could be the opportunity for you to do the same thing. 
Number eight is to consider starting a side business. A side business can be many different things. It can be starting websites like what I do. It could be mowing other people's lawns or doing handyman jobs. It could be making things to sell at the local market or you could sell it online through eBay or Gumtree or Etsy or something like that. You could start a side business using one of your skills and potentially make some extra money on the side. I guess the goal of this extra money for mo most of you would be to actually use that money to save towards your deposit. So rather than use that money to do what I do did and quit your job and go into business full time, you could actually use that money to save a deposit. And look, that's what I did for a period of time. Money that I was making from my online business was going and reinvesting in my online business until it got to the point where I was able to make that shift. So starting an a side business that you can do in your spare time rather than watching that next Game of Thrones episode or rather than going to bed super early, you could sacrifice some of that time, start a side business, start earning a little bit of extra money on the side which you can use towards saving your deposit. Number nine is to rather than trying to save your deposit, why not focus on trying to pay down debt. Maybe you've got a personal loan, a car loan or credit card debt that is stripping you of your cash flow every single month. So what you could be doing is rather than trying to save a deposit, you could focus on paying down that cash flow. For a lot of people and for me in particular, cash flow has been my number one goal. I want to have enough cash flow that I can live the life that I want. Ideally, that cash flow comes from property, but it might come through other means as well. And what happens with debt is you're paying a certain amount that you need to pay on your credit card every month. Depending on your debt, it could be hundreds of dollars every month that you are using just to pay down debt. Well, if you invested in property, maybe it'll earn $100 a month to offset that debt, or maybe you could just pay down that debt, might be easier, and you can gain that $100 a month back in terms of cash flow and lifestyle. And the 10th thing that I think that you should do if you can't save a deposit right now is to actually start thinking in terms of cash flow rather than in terms of net worth. A lot of us, we look at our net worth and we say, okay, well, what do I own? What are my debts? And how does that balance out? For me, I don't have any debt apart from a small credit card bill, which I pay off every single month. So in terms of my net worth, if I add up my car, my computer, all my furniture, maybe, I don't know, I don't know what it would be, but I can work that net worth and work that out, but that doesn't really help me achieve what I want to achieve. That doesn't help me move towards my financial goals of financial freedom. Sure, it's great that the bed that I bought is worth $500 or the couch is worth $1,000 or the TV that I own is worth a couple of hundred dollars, but that's not actually moving me towards my financial goals of financial freedom. So rather than looking at your net worth, why not start looking at your life in terms of cash flow? How much passive income do you have coming in every month and how much expenses do you have going out every month? How can you lower those expenses like getting rid of debt or moving to a cheaper car or moving to a cheaper area or changing your lifestyle in certain ways? And then how can you increase your passive income as well? And the goal is to grow the passive income to the point where it is greater than your expenses so you become financially free. So rather than thinking in terms of, well, how much is, does everything I own actually worth? Well, that's not really affecting your lifestyle and giving you the lifestyle you want. So why not start thinking about, well, what is my cash flow situation? What are my expenses? What's my income? What's my passive income? And how can I focus on getting a better cash flow situation in my life? Because the better your cash flow situation, the more likely you'll be able to save your deposit. So there you have 10 things that you can do if you can't afford to save a house deposit right now. Maybe it's not your time to save a house deposit. Maybe it's not feasible for you to save a house deposit in 12 months. Well, here are some things that you can do to move you towards your goals of financial freedom, even though you can't really save a deposit right now. Sometimes we feel like we can't save a deposit because the goal of the deposit we're trying to save is actually too big. I want to help you actually identify what deposit you really need to save and make that achievable for you so you can go ahead and save a deposit. So if you want to get my free checklist to help you analyze how much deposit you need to save and get on the road to saving that deposit, go to onproperty.com.au forward slash save or simply click the link below this video and you can go there and you can get access and you can download that 
checklist. So go ahead, click the link now and get access to that because I think it's really gonna help you move forward towards saving your next deposit. So until next time, stay positive.